Well, g given the, the Labour Party's expression of uh, policy since the last election, do you think there's any realistic possibility of that? Well, I have to say personally, I don't. <coughs> I mean, and I see. I mean, I don't see. I don't see anything that they're doing in policy that touches the public sector that means that they are on any kind of trajectory that I would recognise as being what I think the Labour Party ought to be. And I don't think that they've got any kind of coherent approach to industrial policy or to any of the things that would mean that we could say this is a party that represents the vast majority of our members, or certainly not Marx members, or the organised trade union movement. Well, but, you know, that that's not to say that there aren't some extremely, you know, very good people still working in the Labour Party. I have to say, you know, they must find it a real struggle. Yeah. But, I, I mean, the, the view that you've expressed is a view that, that uh, probably many people in this room feel. But, but, but where does that leave the trade union movement? I mean, what, what are the trade unions going to do about that situation? Mark's mentioned no political opposition. What, what, what's to be done about that? Well, I think part of it, part of it does have to be the industrial action strategy. We do always, we do have to do that. But also, but also one of the things that, you, you know, this is not lost on any of you, is it? Since the coalition came into office, you don't hear a single member of the government or even a single member of any of those parties speaking in any public forum without saying the mess that, that Labour left us in and all that, all of which, of course, might be true. But they, they have got a wonderfully consistent message. And I think one of the issues about the Labour and Trade Union movement is that we don't have any wonderfully consistent messages. That actually one of the jobs of, you know, I would like to think it's a job of the TUC, is to get those consistent messages and to make sure that whenever any of us speaks on behalf of our own unions or other unions or on behalf of community campaigns or, you know, or, or in my case, on, be, on behalf of children and young people, that we are talking about social justice and fairness. Uh, from my point of view, we'd also be talking about socialism, which is a question we'll come on to later. But we do, you know, we do have to be making the case for all of those things. Now, last week, uh, we weren't on strike, but um, uh, obviously Mark's members were. But after school, a whole bunch of my members, 80 or so of them, went down to the DfE and plastered all over the DfE, this is how much money I've lost this month. And actually, you know, it caught, it caught the imagination of some of our members that they should go down and do that. We will use that extensively. We'll make sure we're all over the place talking about that. And that's something which we could very easily be causing our members to do, small activities. You know, not they don't have to lose any pay. They don't have to go on strike. They will at some point have to go on strike. But they do need to be involved in those things. And we have to have a whole lot of other imaginative things that people are involved with that builds their confidence that eventually they do want to be involved in some kind of political activity. Mark, you, you, you were talking about fielding candidates. candidates. Yeah, uh, my, um, my, my take on this is if there was a straightforward single answer, we'd have found it. And uh, part of the trouble has been over the past period, this debate has become a bit sterile. And it's either the only route is to reclaim the Labour Party, and if you're not in there in some way, you're neglecting your duty. And then the other side of the argument is the Labour Party dead. The sooner we can get past that and actually forge something new, then uh, the better for everyone. Now, the, the reality is, in my view, that where we are at the moment, given we've got 100 years of history and we've got the fact that in many people's eyes, in front of them, the biggest thing they worry about today is what the coalition is doing to them. And, you know, if you ask most people, for all its faults, if we had Labour in tomorrow, it would be a step forward from where we are. So I just don't think it's a simple and straightforward answer. And therefore, for me, it means actually embracing a variety of different tactics and not believing you can predict within five years the answer will be X or Y. It's, it's, it's in some senses, you push at a number of doors uh, and you're prepared to run through the doors and not be afraid if the opportunity presents itself to do something radical. Now, what does that mean in practice? It means, first up, recognising that the UK is changing. Anyone who thinks in Scotland or Wales the only debate now is between Labour or the Tories is mistaken. You know, there is no question that uh, the, the fact that in Scotland there's going to be an independence referendum is a big issue. The fact that in Wales, Plaid Cymru have just elected arguably the most left-wing leader of any party in the UK. She's a real socialist and she's absolutely fantastic, Leanne Wood. That is an added complication. 
the, uh, the the fact that in some constituencies you have your Jeremy Corbyn's, your John McDonald's, the people who've got a brilliant track record, is something I can tell you. If I lived in Hayes and Harlingdon, you know, I would not only vote for John McDonald, I have actually canvassed for him, even though I'm not a member of their party. Uh, so you know, you, you, that, that looks a bit different. If you're in an affiliated union, then you've got big debate to have. Now, I, I saw that when Len was here last year, he, he talked about the, uh, they make him a point where we have to talk about founding a, a new party. But as I understand what United are doing now, it's essentially trying to make real the many years of what they said about trying to reclaim the party and do some real grassroots work. It's in all of our interests, I think, that that's a success. What I think would be wrong is if we put all our eggs in the basket of thing, and if that, that has to be a success because we've got no other strategy. So w where I'm at here is you build broader movements, you argue consistently for the politics that challenge the consensus that we have, which is Labour's main failing, I have to say, which is why I don't think it inspires anyone. Uh, that might mean for, for PCS, for example, we uh, ultimately in the short term would end up supporting different people in different places, not because we think that is the answer to all the UK's problems, but it may advance us a bit further forward. I personally believe that one of the most important changes we could make in British politics is to go for proportional representation. And I say that not because the coalition, which is a, a, a shocking example of politics coming together and uh, stitching up deals, but I say it because until we have a system whereby there is the ability to vote for anything other than the three main parties, I think you will always have the uh, suffocation of political debate within too narrow a confine. So I, I think PR is important. And I would pray in aid that in Scotland, in the Scottish parliamentary elections in 1999, something pretty remarkable happened under, under PR, where 10% of the Scottish Parliament were filled by radical MSPs, either from the Greens or from the Scottish Socialist Party. They were all to the left of the mainstream parties, and it was good at that particular point in Scotland. There is another story there, though, because the left is littered with examples whenever anything looks remotely like it's going well, people split. Uh, and if you found a party of 10, you've usually got three factions by the end of the week. And, and, and of course, we've got to overcome much of the sectarianism and dead-endism that I think often features as part of this debate. So my final point about why, therefore, would we in be interested in standing candidates? And it's really interesting, this big ballot we're having because we're actually asking for a membership mandate on a full postal ballot. It's very radical. And uh, what we're saying is not that PCS will now field 650 candidates in the next general election, uh, uh, and if we win, Janice Godrich or me will be the Prime Minister. And that's not the idea. We're not going to become a political party. But what it recognises is sometimes elections give you an opportunity, if you stand for things that none of the existing candidates stand for, to really support your campaigning ideas and to give you a purchase. Nobody can argue, in my view, whether they like the result or not, that George Galloway's victory in Bradford West resonated way beyond the electorate of Bradford. It was national news. And it was national news out of a by-election. And therefore, our view is that, uh, the example I've used is this, is that if you turn the clock back four years ago, Pat McFadden was the uh, Labour cabinet member responsible for the post office. He was seeking to take post office privatisation through Parliament. He was supported by the Lib Dems and the Tories to all intents and purposes who all wanted the pri post office privatised. Now to my mind, in Wolverhampton, in his constituency, if a postal worker had stood in that election and said, I'm the only candidate who offers you the opportunity to have a wholly owned public postal service, democratically not only would that be a good thing but actually it would have given us the ability to build a campaign and to challenge ideas fast forward that now if you had a by-election let's just say this where the candidates were ian duncan smith and they were um, liam byrne who's the labor party spokesperson on welfare they both agree that welfare needs to be trimmed. They both seem to think that caps on benefits the answer, except Liam Byrne wants regional caps on benefit, for God's sake, and the Tories just want caps on benefits. None of them are talking about attacking excessive rents. The reason why housing benefits costing too much is because landlords are, are trousering millions and millions <laughs> of pounds. So I think it would be a really good thing if a pensioner or somebody in defence of the welfare state, an unemployed person or a young person, actually said, well, I stand for no cuts in welfare. I stand for a different approach. Now, that isn't going to give us a different government, but out of it may well come the opportunity for political movements and for the unions to make some gains. And, and therefore, in, in, in a nutshell, my answer to this 
is there is no one solution at the moment. Anyone who advocates one solution, I think, is probably doomed to not be successful. But the answer, I think, is to embrace a variety of tactics going forward and to constantly uh, make assessments. And that's why we want a mandate to stand uh, in, in elections. And I think if we got it, and we as a union did stand, for example, in a seat where there may be masses of public sector workers and we raise issues of public services, I think I would not underestimate the political effect that could have much wider than the one particular by-election. And it's one small contribution to what ultimately I think needs to bring us to a situation where somebody starts arguing against a neoliberal consensus and actually argues for a society that is very, very different to the one that any of the main parties offer. Have you discussed that with, with other unions? Are other, are other unions likely to come on board with that uh, possibility? Well, at the moment, we've, the only discussions we've had up to this point have been on the, pre, pre, on the thing that we did previously, which is make your vote count, which was actually based on, in elections, asking candidates to give answers to certain questions, publicising them to all the members and saying, you make your vote count based on what they say. And we cooperated with the NUT, the RMT, the Fire Brigades Union. And we actually had some brilliant hustings and political meetings where actually the politicians were getting questions from the left, you know, uh, that actually was quite formative in, mm. in, in giving people more of an idea where people stood. Mm. Uh, we have not gone further and asked about this question because my own opinion at the moment is this is the one ballot I can tell you that I don't know what the outcome would be. Yeah. We are challenging a hundred years of people who think civil servants shouldn't be political on the one hand, to people who think unions are about the bread and butter and not about politics, uh, right through to people who are Labour Party stalwarts, really good activists, who find this somehow challenging to what they've done for the last 30 years. So this is going to be a brilliant debate. And, and I would say to you that our formulation for this debate is we're having a campaign that has got literature and videos, workplace meetings, and the thing we're saying is we want mass participation and the very fact we'll be discussing politics in the workplace in and of itself, I think, is, mm. is a justification for the approach that we're taking. Mm.